Today's video is about a very fundamental polynomial time algorithm for graph homomorphism problems and more generally for constraint satisfaction problems, the so-called path consistency procedure. Surprisingly often, if a constraint satisfaction problem can be solved in polynomial time, it can be solved by this procedure. And even though it's a quite simple procedure, the question which problems can be solved by the path consistency procedure is a surprisingly interesting question. Let me put today's topic into the context of this lecture a series. So what we've seen before is another algorithm, the R consistency procedure. It's also polynomial time, but sometimes the R consistency procedure can't detect unsatisfiability, even though the input is unsatisfiable. That's the disadvantage. On the other hand, what's quite nice about the R consistency procedure is that we understand very well when it works. We have the power graph for that. We have seen that uh, this can also be characterized in terms of uh, so-called tree dualities and most importantly, maybe uh, the existence of totally symmetric polymorphisms of all arities. This is in many situations easy to check via the existence of a semi-lattice polymorphism. Oh, so that's all what we've seen in previous lectures. Today, we will uh, learn about the path consistency procedure, which is a stronger algorithm than the R consistency procedure. And again, we will see a condition that implies that the path consistency procedure is correct. It's the existence again, of certain polymorphisms, this time majority polymorphisms. This is a property that is easy to check. Now, if you have a given graph H, we'll see at the end of the talk, we can efficiently find out whether there is a majority polymorphism. And if there is one, then the constraint satisfaction problem for this graph with the majority polymorphism can be solved in polynomial time with the path consistency procedure. So that's the outline of today. Let's get started. To illustrate the idea of the path consistency procedure, let's look at the following example. We have on the left a graph G, and we would like to know whether it homomorphically maps to this directed cycle of length 3, the C3. This is H. The R consistency procedure would not be able to make a single inference. The R consistency procedure cannot be used to detect that, in fact, there is no homomorphism. So we need a stronger uh, algorithm. And this is the path consistency procedure. And the, the idea is that we do not eliminate possible values for single variables, but we eliminate pairs of values for pairs of variables. Let's look at the edge from A to B. The edge from A to B means that every homomorphism from G to H must map the pair AB to either, either the pair 0, 1 or the pair 1, 2 or the pair 2, 0. Now, this is the homomorphism condition. Edges must be preserved. There are just three edges in H. And edges must be mapped to edges. This is why we, we have this list. So we also have this list, for instance, for the edge BC. Now, the path consistency procedure looks at three variables at a time to make its inferences. We pick, for example, the triple ABC. The fact that we have an edge from A to B and an edge from B to C, what does it tell us about the pair AC? It restricts the possible val pairs of values that can be attained by this pair of variables. We can combine the pair 0, 1 with the pair 1, 2. That's an option, right? A homomorphism can map A to 0, B to 1, and C to 2. So this pair fits with that pair. We also have a fit between the pair 1, 2 and the pair 2, 0. And finally, the pair 2, 0 and the pair 0, 1. Which means that the final list of pairs of values for AC is 0, 2, 2, 1 and 1, 0. Let's repeat 
the entire argument, but for the triple CDA. For CDA, all edges are reversed. So we get the list by the analogous reasoning 2, 0, 0, 1, and 1, 2. Everything reversed. So we have derived two lists of possible values and the intersection between these two lists is empty. That's what I mean by shrink. In this situation, we have shrinked the list of possible values to the empty set, which means that there is no homomorphism. Now we conclude there is no homomorphism. We have derived the empty list, so there can't be a homomorphism from G to H. Now it's the time to look at the pseudocode of the path consistency procedure. Let's fix a finite digraph H. The path consistency procedure depends on H. The input of this procedure is a finite digraph G. We would like to know is there homomorphism from G to H. The data structure that we maintain for this task is a list of pairs of vertices of H for every pair of vertices of G. Initially, we have to initialize the data structure. We do it as follows. If we have a pair of vertices of G that forms an edge in G, well, we know every homomorphism must map edges to edges. So we set this list to the set of edges of H. That's here. Otherwise, if there's no edge, well, we still have the possibility that uh, these two vertices of G are equal, X equals Y, in which case the list should only contain pairs of equal vertices of H. Finally, if none of these cases applies, we set the list to the set of all possible pairs of vertices of H. All right, now comes the main loop of the algorithm. The main loop removes pairs of vertices of H from the lists, and it does so as follows. It picks three variables, X, Y, and Z, three vertices of G. And we now wonder whether we can maybe remove the pair UV from the list for X and Z. And we can remove it uh, if there is no vertex V in H, such that UV forms a pair in the list for X, Y, and VW forms a pair in the list of Y, Z. If there's no such V, well, there can't, can't be a homomorphism from H from G to H that preserves the list. So we can remove the pair UV from the list for X, Z. If in this way we find the empty list, we can be sure there's no homomorphism from G to H and we reject. Otherwise, well, we repeat and repeat and repeat. And at some point, we'll no longer be able to remove pairs of vertices from lists. And at that point, we hope that there's a homomorphism from G to H. We can't be sure, but we hope. That's the algorithm. So let's summarize what we've just seen about the path consistency procedure. If this algorithm says no, if it rejects, then we can be sure that there's no homomorphism from G to H. What's also clear is that the running time of this procedure is polynomial. This is because there is only a quadratic number of pairs that can be removed from each list. And actually, if the graph H is fixed, it's actually only a constant number of pairs of values that can be removed for each list. We have quadratically many lists. So altogether, this uh, it can be bounded by n to the 3, if you implement it cleverly. 
On the other hand, if the algorithm does not reject, we, we are not sure whether there is a solution. For certain graphs, it turns out that the path consistency procedure rejects if and only if there is no homomorphism from G to H. So we have both directions. And this is precisely the situation that we would like to understand. When can we use the path consistency procedure as a necessary and sufficient condition for the existence of homomorphisms? If it's the case, then we'll say PC solves CSP of H. The path consistency procedure solves the CSP. What should also be fairly clear is that the path consistency procedure is strictly more powerful than the arc consistency procedure. Because with pairs of values, you can in particular simulate single values. Whenever arc consistency can detect an empty set, then the path consistency procedure can detect an empty list of pairs. All right, what we'll also see in a second is that the path consistency procedure can do strictly more. It can, for instance, solve CSP of directed cycles. On the other hand, we also know already an example where path consistency cannot solve the CSP, namely for K3. Why is that? Well, there are two ways of seeing it. One way assumes that we believe that, uh, that P is different from NP. In this case, there can't be a polynomial time algorithm for CSP of K3. This is just three colorability. It's an NP complete problem. There can't be a polynomial algorithm is P if P is different from NP. So since the path consistency procedure is a polynomial time algorithm, path consistency cannot solve CSP of K3. If you want to prove the same thing without complexity theoretic assumptions, it's also not so difficult. The only thing is you have to find a graph which is not three colorable and the path consistency procedure does not detect an empty list. I leave you this task as an exercise. Find such a graph. Hey guys, here comes my recommendation for the Corona Sport Program. This time, Fahrrad Tour, my favorite route through Dresdner Heide. You start in Neustadt, of course. Then we go all the way up. Kannehenkelweg is a little bit steep, but then you are rewarded. Once you are at Königsplatz, somewhere here, there's no up and down anymore. We go Rennsteig. And then comes a relatively straight, at some point we'll follow Alte Eins. And all the way to Ullersdorf, very nice with water, no up and down, no people. It's a fantastic route. And from there, you can then go down with the cars, but down the hill rapidly, hyper fast, go back to Neustadt. This is a, a really nice bike route. Enjoy. To understand when the path consistency procedure solves a given graph homomorphism problem, Polymorphisms are again the key. A ternary operation F is called a majority operation if whenever it receives two or three arguments that are equal to X, the operation F returns the value X. We will give several examples. Let D be a linearly ordered set. We define F as follows. If X, Y and Z are elements of D, then f applied to x, y, and z returns the middle element with respect to the linear order on D. Clearly, this satisfies the identities from the definition of a majority operation. And we call this operation the median operation on D. We also give an example which has the median operation as a polymorphism. It is the graph that we called Tn for a transitive tournament. The vertices of Tn were the elements 1 up to n, and the edge relation of Tn is the strict order on the numbers 1 up to n. The reason why the median operation preserves Tn is that if you strictly increase all the arguments of the median operation, you also increase the function value. Our second example of a majority operation looks more ad hoc. We call this operation a P. 
when some of the arguments of p are equal, we already know from the majority identities how p must look like. So we only have to define p on three pairwise distinct arguments. And in this case, we simply return the first argument. Note that the operation p defined in this way is a polymorphism of Cn. To see this, suppose we feed the three edges uu prime, vv prime, and ww prime into our operation p. Note that in the graph Cn, the vertices uvw are pairwise distinct if and only if u prime, v prime, and w prime are pairwise distinct. So we consider two cases. If they are pairwise distinct, then p acts like a projection to the first argument and hence preserves the edge relation. On the other hand, if two arguments are equal, say v equals w, then v prime must be equal to w prime as well. And hence p applied to u v w returns v and p applied to u prime v prime w prime returns v prime. And v v prime is an edge as we already know. And the other cases are of course similar. So this shows that P is a polymorphism of the graph Cn, of the directed cycle. Now comes the most important result of today's video. It says that if H is a finite directed graph with a majority polymorphism, then path consistency solves the constraint satisfaction problem for H. This is a result of Feder and Vardy, first published in 1993 in the conference proceedings of the Symposium on Theory of Computing, which is America's best conference series in the area. As almost everything in this course, this result generalizes well from digraphs to more general relational structures that will be covered later in the course. The theorem subsumes many criteria that have been studied before, for example in artificial intelligence or in graph theory, the paper of Feder and Vardy is a fantastic piece of work that really founded the area. I myself uh, got a paper copy of that paper from a friend in 1999, I guess simply because it had both constraints and group theory in the title, which were both topics that I liked. I was traveling from a summer school in Liverpool to Edinburgh and I was sitting in the train and I had some free time and started reading the 97 full version of the paper and it fascinated me from the very first moment on. It is very dense, and even in the journal version, some of the proofs are rather proof sketches, but I found it really inspiring. Before we prove this theorem, we need to make some preliminary observations. Let G and H be finite digraphs, and let F be a polymorphism of H. And let X and Z be two vertices of G. We consider the list L of xz that is computed by the path consistency procedure when executed on G. I claim that F must preserve this list in the following sense. If u1, w1, u2, w2, and so on, until uk, wk are pairs in L, then the pair u, w, formed by applying F to the start points of the edges u1 up to uk, and by applying f to the endpoints of the edges w1 up to wk, this pair uw is again in L. To prove this statement, we show by induction over the execution of the algorithm that the pair uw is never removed from L of xz. Initially, we have to distinguish two cases. If L is the set of all pairs of vertices of H, then in particular the pair U, W is in L and there's nothing to be shown. The other case is that L equals initially the set of edges of H. In this case, U, W is the result of applying a polymorphism to edges of H, so it must again be an edge by the definition of polymorphisms. So this is also easy. In the inductive step, we have to consider the situation where pairs are removed from the lists. To remove a pair from the list of x, z, by the definition of the path consistency procedure, we consider a third variable y. 
for each i from 1 up to k, there exists a value vi of the vertices of h, such that ui vi is in the list of xy, and vi wi is in the list for yz. Otherwise, the procedure would have removed ui wi from the list for xz. By the inductive assumption, therefore, we have that f applied to u1 up to uk, comma, f applied to v1 up to vk is in the list for xy, and f applied to v1 up to vk, and f applied w1 up to wk is in the list for yz. So u w is not removed from the list for xz, again by the definition of the path consistency procedure. And this concludes the induction. Let's now prove the theorem of Feder and Vardy. If the path consistency procedure derives the empty list, then G clearly has no homomorphism to H. That's what we've already seen. Otherwise, at the final stage of the execution of the path consistency procedure on G, all the lists are non-empty. We need to show that there exists a homomorphism from G to H. We construct the homomorphism inductively and prove the following claim. We prove that for every map from an induced subgraph of G to H that preserves the lists, there exists an extension to any other vertex in G such that the extension again preserves the lists. We call maps that preserve the lists good maps in the following. We prove this claim by induction on the number of vertices of the subgraph. The, case, the base case is that for all vertices x1, x2, x3 of G and for every good map from x1 and x2 to h, let's call it little h, there is a good extension to x3. Otherwise the pair h applied to x1, h applied to x2 would have been removed from uh, the list for x1, x2 by the path consistency procedure. For the inductive step, let x be a vertex of g that is not in the subgraph, let's call it g prime. Let x1, x2 and x3 be vertices of g prime and let h prime be a good map from g prime to h. Now consider h j prime the restriction of h prime to g prime without x j. So h j prime is not defined on x j for j equals 1, 2 and 3. By the inductive assumption, h j prime is or has a good extension to x. We will use our majority polymorphism f and define the extension h of h prime by applying the polymorphism to h1 of x, h2 of x and h3 of x. And we will prove that this extension h is a good map. The first case that we consider is that the vertex y is distinct from x1, x2 and x3. In this case already h prime was defined on y. And using the majority identity, we can write h prime of y as the function value of f evaluated at h1 of y, h2 of y, and h3 of y. Since f preserves the list for x and y by the lemma, we get that h of x, y is in this list. The second case is that y is equal to one of the vertices x1, x2, x3, say 2x1. By the definition of the path consistency procedure, there exists a vertex v of h such that the pair formed by h1 
of x and v is in the list L for x and y. Again, using the identity satisfied by majority operations, we can write h of y as the function value of f applied to v, h prime of y, and h prime of y again. So we see two arguments are equal, so the function value applied to these three arguments will be h prime of y. So the pair h of x, h of y, can be written as the result of the operation f applied component-wise to the pairs h1 of x, v, h2 of x, h2 of y, h3 of x, h3 of y, and all of these three pairs are in the list L. Since f preserves the lists, we obtain that the pair h of x, h of y, is in the list L. So we indeed found a good map from G to H, which in particular is a homomorphism from G to H. And this concludes the proof. If this proof was a little bit fast for you, this is completely normal. It just means that you have to look at the script and read the proof and read it again and read it again. And that's the way you will finally understand it. And it is worth it. Because it has a very, it's a very beautiful idea. Right? The idea is that you, you take partial solutions and you interpolate them in some sense using the polymorphism. You patch them together to produce a larger partial solution and you make the partial solutions larger and larger until at the end you get your solution to the graph homomorphism problem. Some concluding remarks about the path consistency procedure and the proof of Federvardi. The first is that, and this is a relatively easy exercise that you can also find in the script, the path consistency procedure and the proof of Federvardi can be adapted to a slightly more general problem than the graph homomorphism problem, the so-called pre-colored graph homomorphism problem. In this problem, we are not only given a graph G, we are also given some colors that force certain variables in G, certain vertices of G to be mapped to certain vertices of H. That's what we refer to as colors. Yeah. So in some sense, we are given not only the graph, but also a partially defined homomorphism from G to H. And the task is to extend this homomorphism to the full task, to a full homomorphism. And it's relatively easy to adapt the path consistency procedure to solve also these tasks. And the same proof that we have seen just before works to prove that path consistency is correct also for such problems if there is a majority polymorphism of G. Next comment is that we only have one direction. For the R consistency procedure, we saw a necessary and sufficient condition for solvability by R consistency. Here, we only have one direction. If you have a majority polymorphism, then the path consistency procedure is correct. Another point that I wanted to mention, it's also described in detail in the script. The path consistency procedure can be made even stronger by not looking at three vertices at the time, but four vertices at the time and making stronger inferences, maintaining not pairs or lists of pairs but lists of triples or k tuples in general and this is called k consistency uh, k, for k equals one you just get back r consistency for k equals two you get path consistency and for larger k this k consistency will do strictly more inferences likewise the concept of majority polymorphism can be generalized. Um, so a near unanimity operation of RETK, this is a function of RETK that satisfies some identities uh, similar to the majority identities. And if you instantiate this definition with K equals three, you get precisely back majority polymorphisms. And then the same proof that we've seen today can be used to show that if H 
has near unanimity polymorphisms of area TK plus 1, then the CSP of H can be solved by K consistency. To get a necessary and sufficient condition for solvability by path consistency or by K consistency, this is also possible but much more difficult. And this comes uh, much later in the course. How difficult is it to decide for a given finite digraph H whether H has a majority polymorphism? It is relatively easy to see that this problem is in the complexity class NP. But is it in P? Can we decide this question in polynomial time? The answer is yes, and this is again a very clever, very nice and inspiring idea of Feather and Vardy. And we look at that in the final part of today's video. Recall that polymorphisms of H of area T3 are just homomorphisms from the third power of H to H. So we take the graph H to the 3 and merge all the vertices that have the form xxy, xyx, yxx, and xxx. Note that every majority polymorphism of H would have to map these elements of H to the 3 to the same vertex of H. And this is why we merge them. Let G be the resulting graph. Note that the homomorphisms from G to H correspond precisely to the majority polymorphisms of H. So to prove that our problem of finding a majority polymorphism is an NP, we just have to guess such a map and verify that it's a homomorphism. And indeed, the existence of a homomorphism from G to H can be decided in polynomial time. And the trick is on the next slide. The idea is to run the path consistency procedure on G. If the path consistency procedure derives the empty list, then certainly there's no homomorphism from G to H, and H has no majority polymorphism. Otherwise, a priori we don't know. So what we do is we pick a vertex of G and remove all but one pair of the form U, U from the list for the pair x comma x. Then we restart the path consistency procedure. If an empty list is derived, we know that the pair u u was a bad choice for xx, for the list for xx, and we continue with another pair, say v v from the list for xx. If this fails for all choices of pairs from the list for xx, then we know that the path consistency procedure gave a wrong answer previously. It didn't derive the empty list even though it should have. So, by the theorem of Feder and Vardy, H does not have a majority polymorphism. It's the contraposition. All right. So, we can continue like this for each variable of G. So that at the end, for every pair of the form XX, our list just contains one pair u u and then we can look at the map that sends x to u and that's a homomorphism from g to h and this finishes the proof welcome to our session how do i stay healthy during corona times today we have a special guest otto Hello. and we looked in internet how uh, in the in youtube which YouTube videos gets a lot of clicks? Get a lot of clicks, it's unboxing mm -hmm. videos. So we decided to make a little unboxing session today. So we have this little box. And uh, you know what is in there? No. No. So we... Uh, so it's something related to health. Huh? Something healthy. Okay. So what do we have? What product can I offer you? We have some leech. And you see, this is a great leech, great thick, thick leech. And we see it's not thick industrial leech, it's like it has some earth still on it, on this. 
we have uh, potatoes. potatoes. And um, this is unprocessed food, really unprocessed food. This is not fake, this is really earth, earth on it. Then spinach, whole chunks of spinach, very nice, like thick, thick spinach. Another leech. And we have radish. You can also eat uh, uh, the leaves, also great for making soups and, um, and even more spinach and onions. Do you like it? Uh, not so much. What, what, you, what you don't like? Uh, onions. Onions. And the rest? Oh, it's good. The rest is good. This is great unboxing stuff, yeah.